We'd like to define the dimension of a vector space to be the size of a basis of that vector space. The problem is we know that vector spaces can have lots of different bases. So before we can make that definition, we need to show that any two bases have the same size. That's what this lecture is going to be dedicated to proving. Once we've done that, the dimension of a vector space will turn out to be a really useful measure of how large, in some sense, that vector space is. The first step on our way to proving this result is called the spanning lemma. What it says is that if you have a spanning set, S1 up to Sm, of a vector space V, and if you have an element, little v of big V, which can be written as a linear combination of the S's in such a way that the coefficient of Sj is not zero, then the sequence you get by replacing Sj with V is still a spanning set for V. To prove this, we're going to start by making a definition, which is that S, capital S, will be the span of this new list of vectors. So the list that you get by swapping Sj for V. It contains S1 up to Sj minus 1, and then it contains V, and then Sj plus 1 up to Sm. So the goal of our proof is to show that S, capital S, is equal to the vector space capital V. So I want to observe that it's enough to show that capital S contains each one of S1, S2, up to Sm. Well, if so, then S is a subspace, so it contains any linear combination of S1 up to Sm. The reason for that is that the definition of subspace is that it is a subset which contains zero and which is closed under addition and scalar multiplication. So you can use closure under addition and scalar multiplication multiple times to show that any linear combination of S1 up to Sm is an element of S. Now, S1 up to Sm is a spanning set, so in this case, S would have to be equal to V because you can write any element of V as a linear combination of S1 up to Sm. Now from the definition of S, it certainly contains all of the Si's except Sj. So what we need to do is just to prove that Sj is an element of S. So how can we do that? Well, let's just take the expression just here and rearrange it for Sj. So I will move sj over to the left-hand side of that equation, or lambda j sj over to the left-hand side, and I will move v over to the right-hand side. When I do that, I get lambda j sj equals v minus the sum over all i not equal to j of lambda i s i. Okay, so that's just a simple rearrangement of the equation at the top there. So let's now multiply this by 1 over lambda j. It makes sense to do that because lambda j is non-zero. 
So I get lambda j to the minus 1 times v minus, and then when I distribute the lambda j through the sum, I can write this as lambda j to the minus 1 times lambda i times si, where the sum is over all i not equal to j. Okay, but then look what you've got here on the right-hand side. This thing right here is an element of S because it is visibly a linear combination of the S's, so Si's, which, where I is not equal to J, and V, which is exactly what is in the definition of S. So we get to conclude that Sj is in the span of S1 up to Sj minus 1, then V, and then Sj plus 1 up to Sm. That completes our proof. So we're done. The next result we need is sometimes called the Steinitz exchange lemma. So I'll write that name here. What it says is that if you have a vector space V, which contains a spanning set S1 up to Sm, and a linearly independent set L1 up to Ln, then actually m is greater than or equal to n. So you could rephrase that like in the title by saying that any spanning set must be at least as large as any linearly independent set. So I hope you can see how this is going to be useful to us in proving that any two bases have the same size. That's what we're going to come to on the next slide. Let's now do the proof of this. So what we'll first do is observe that L1, the first of our linearly independent elements, is an element of V, and S1 up to Sm is a spanning set for V. Therefore, L1 must be a linear combination of S1 up to Sm. So let's write that linear combination down. We'll use summation notation and we'll write it as the sum from i equals 1 up to m of lambda i times s i. Okay, not all of these lambda i's can be 0, because if they were, then L1 would be 0. But the 0 vector can't be an element of a linearly independent set because if it was, you would get a very straightforward linear dependence on that set just by multiplying the zero vector by one and having that as the only term in your linear combination. So it can't be that L is equal to the zero vector. So one of these lambda i's must be non-zero. In fact, without loss of generality, by renumbering the s's, if we like, then without loss of generality, lambda one is non-zero. It's okay to renumber the s's because it doesn't change how many of them there are. Okay, if lambda 1 is not equal to 0, then by the lemma which we proved on the previous slide, we can swap L1 with S1. 
and still get a spanning set. Okay, let's play the same game, this time with L2. This thing is a spanning set, so we can write L2 as a linear combination. So what we get is some multiple of L1, let's say mu1 L1, and then I get the sum from i equals 2 to m of lambda i s i. These lambdas might be different to the lambdas we had before. But okay, that's what, it, um, that's what we can do because we know that uh, L1, S2 up to Sm is a spanning set. We can write L2 as a linear combination of those things. And this is how I choose to write that linear combination. Now again, um, not all of the lambdas can be zero. And the reason for that is if they were all zero, then you would have a linear dependence relation on L1 and L2. So L2 equals mu1 L1. We could rewrite that as L1 minus mu1 L... L2 minus mu1 L1 equals the zero vector, which would be... Um, which would contradict the Ls being linearly independent. Okay, not all of the lam of lambda 2 up to lambda m can be 0. So again, by renumbering the s's if necessary, we can assume that lambda 2 was non-zero. So let's just say without loss of generality, lambda 2 is not equal to 0. Then, again, I can use the lemma from the previous slide. To get that L1... L2 and then S3 up to Sm is the spanning set. Okay, and we could repeat this process as much as we like. So now let's assume for a contradiction that M is less than N. Well, then we just repeat this um, m times. We repeat, repeat this procedure m times. When we do that, we exhaust all of the s's. So we get rid of all of the s's. And we end up with L1, L2, up to Lm being a spanning set. Now, we are assuming m is less than n, so L m plus 1 can be written as a linear combination of L1 up to L m. So again, these lambda i's are different to the lambda i's that we've used in the previous parts of this proof. But what you have here is a contradiction to L1 up to Ln being linearly independent. So we're done. We have our contradiction to our assumption that m was less than n, and therefore it must be that m is greater than or equal to n, which is what we set out to prove. Finally, we're ready to go now on our big theorem. Um, and before we do this, I would like to make a 
small definition, which is that a vector space is called finite dimensional if it has a finite spanning set. We're then ready to say our theorem, which is that all bases of a finite dimensional vector space have the same size. Let's do the proof. So we'll suppose V is finite dimensional. So let's say it has a finite spanning set V1 up to V, Vn. We now notice that any basis of V has to have size at most n. Because if you had a basis which had size larger than n, that will contradict our theorem from the previous slide, which said that any linearly independent set has size at most the size of a spanning set. So any linearly independent sequence of vectors in V has size less than or equal to n by the result on the last slide. So in particular, if you have a basis of V, it's got to be a finite set because a basis is in particular linearly independent. I shouldn't have said set then, I should have said finite sequence. Remember, bases are sequences, their order matters. So let's suppose we have two different bases. So let's say B1 up to BK and C1 up to CL are bases of V. Okay, we only know that the bases have to be finite sets because of the argument we just made. So let's add this in. Okay, we've got these two bases. What can we say? Um, let's give them a name. Let's call this one curly B and this one curly C. Well, now we know that B is linearly independent and C is a spanning set. So what does that tell you from the last lemma, um, from the last theorem? It tells you, the, the last the, um, theorem told you that the size of any spanning set is at least the size of a linearly independent set. So L is greater than or equal to K. But we can play the same game the other way around. C is also linearly independent and B spans V. So K is greater than or equal to L. Putting those two together, K equals L. Right, that proves that any two bases have the same size, so we are finally in a position to make the definition we wanted to make, which is that the dimension of a vector space, which we write like this as dim V, is the size of any basis of V. And we've seen at least finite dimensional vector spaces that any two bases have the same size and therefore, this definition makes sense. Uh, it's still true for infinite dimensional vector spaces, but um, the proof is just a little bit, little bit more complicated. So most of the time in 0, 0, 0, 0005, we only care about finite dimensional vector spaces anyway. In fact, I think I've only written down one example of a vector space which was not finite dimensional so far. So see if you can work out which one it was.